Uh, now we can start. Finally, uh, we can start. So uh, today we have the pleasure of listening to Professor uh, Jose Valle uh, at our regular Satir webinar. Uh, I don't think there is uh, any need to introduce him. He is a key scientist in particle physics, and especially in neutrino physics uh, theory and phenomenology. Uh, some of us uh, uh, collaborate uh, or collaborated with him in various projects. Uh, uh, Jose visited us some time ago, right? Uh, like uh, 10 years ago, I don't remember precisely. No, less, less. Less, I less, or seven, like, years. yeah, yeah. Few years, maybe uh, five years. Six years, years six years. Six, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, we hope to, to have him again uh, uh, soon, probably next uh, January, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, uh, today, Jose will tell us about neutrino physics and the landscape of new physics, right? Neutrinos and the likes landscape of new physics. So, Jose, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. I see many familiar faces. First, I wish to thank the organizers for the invitation. It is always a pleasure for me to visit Chile, even if virtually. Uh, uh, actually, it is, this is my first time at the Millennium uh, Program, uh, but uh, as uh, Sergei mentioned, next year, I should visit Chile in person for the HEP workshop and the school that you guys are organizing. So um, my task today is to illustrate how neutrinos may serve as guidance uh, for exploring the landscape of new physics. And I start from the status of neutrino oscillations. Uh, most neutrino phenomena are nicely described in terms of the three neutrino paradigm, uh, described by six oscillation parameters you see here on top three mixing angles, describing solar, atmospheric, and reactor conversions. And down below, you see the two splittings, independent splittings, and the phase. Uh, we have a very good measurement of the uh, parameters indicated in green. That is the solar mixing, the reactor mixing, and the solar splitting. However, we do not have a very good measurement of the atmospheric angle. Here we have the octant problem. We have solutions at uh, higher, the higher octant and the lower octant. And moreover, we have two possibilities uh, associated to normal or inverted order neutrino spectrum. And this corresponds to the ambiguity that we still have in determining the ordering you see down here, the middle a plot uh, below, uh, we have two solutions uh, for the uh, atmospheric splitting corresponding to normal and inverted ordering. And finally, the CP uh, determination is still rather poor, especially in the case of normal ordering. These oscillation parameters can be nicely arranged as the diagonal entries of this matrix that you see here using the same color code, you see the well-measured parameters and those that are not well-measured. And you see all pairwise parameter correlations, including the one I encircle in green here, which for this talk, I will call the ignorance plane eh, because it correlates the two most poorly determined of the oscillation parameters, the CP phase and the atmospheric mixing. So this uh, matrix is extremely important. Eh? If you have any theory of flavor, you are bound to make predictions on some entry or entries of this matrix. And the entries need not be diagonal ones. More often than not, uh, theories of flavor uh, predict correlations, not numerical values of the oscillation parameters. So, uh, using the tables that you can download from our website and also from Zenodo, you can confront any theory of flavor that you may be interested in with the experimental data in a rather 
easy and neat manner so as to determine the uh, consistent regions or predictions of ERT. Turning to experiment, uh, we are now discuss uh, the fact that we have these three loose ends with the three neutrino paradigm uh, is a beautiful picture. Uh, uh, everything converges to it, almost everything. Uh, but uh, we have these ambiguities left concerning the ordering of the neutrino states, the octant of the atmospheric mixing, and the value of the CP phase. I will discuss uh, the fact that these three points, in fact, constitute the target of the next generation of experiments. Uh, and I will discuss their prospects, for example, in towards improving what we now know of Delta CP. And the two biggest experiments are shown here. We have Hyper Kamiokande. This is the hyper version of Super K, going from 50 kiloton detector to a half megaton water Cherenkov detector. And then you have the deep underground neutrino experiment, uh, which shoots neutrinos produced in the Fermilab complex eh, all the way to the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And there is an underground mine set up there. Eh, the distance is about 1,300 kilometers. And this mine setup is precisely the setup uh, where Ray Davis pioneered his solar neutrino studies in the 60s. So uh, I will now discuss the prospect for Dune as a closest example to us, because we happen to be members of the collaboration as the, uh, the prospects for that experiment to uh, probe C leptonic CP violation in oscillations. And the answer you see here, these are these black lines. And they show the significance with which a given value of delta CP can be established uh, within that experiment. And I also show these colored lines down below corresponding to different choices of this alpha to one parameter characterizing unitarity violation. Um, first, you may ask, why do that? First, there is a, a theoretical reason, because probing for uh, this uh, unitarity violation constitute an interesting physics objective on its own right, uh, to the extent that it would probe the mechanism of neutrino mass generation. But also from a practical point of view, it is important. Eh? And you can see here that these uh, curves, they lie below the black one. So there is a degraded sensitivity. And the degrading is very easy to understand. It follows simply from the fact that if you violate unitarity, uh, then the, there are additional CP phase with which delta CP can be confused. So that degrades the sensitivity. So the only way to restore the sensitivity is improving the bounds on unitarity violation. The tighter the bounds, the closer you'll be to the black limit of the neutrino paradigm. And this is exactly what can be done within short baseline experiments. For example, at Fermilab itself. Fermilab will have a near distance program that is ideally suited to improve the sensitivity on unitarity violation, hence establishing the robustness of the long-term and long-distance CP violation uh, search program. But you see here that perhaps it is not as good as we might desire the level of sensitivity that you can reach. Yes, it closes, it reaches about three sigma, but only when you are very close to maximal uh, values of delta CP, uh, of the modules of delta CP. Uh, one can improve the sensitivity in experiments based with shorter baseline, for example, hyper K. But instead of describing hyper K results concerning this, I want to advertise the fact that Europe 
also has it a neutrino proposal, a neutrino proposal uh, using neutrinos from the European installation source. And there is a neutrino superbeam experiment that we don't, it is still in, in planning. So we don't yet uh, know the baseline, but if you choose that baseline to be around 200 kilometers, then you can see that it will perform uh, much better than Dune actually concerning the CP uh, sensitivity. Now I move to theory and interpretation of the oscillation results. Lacking a fundamental theory of flavor, uh, theorists have played with numerology. And here our British friends have been rather successful. Uh, they coined just by numerology, the so-called 3B maximal mixing pattern, uh, which captures the most essential features of the oscillation phenomenon. You have bimaximal atmospheric mixing, trimaximal solar mixing, no reactor mixing, and hence no CP violation. Even though no longer viable, this pattern still today uh, is useful because it provides a starting point from where one can systematically generalize by exploiting symmetries so as to obtain uh, patterns that are not only viable, but also predictive. For example, the one shown here, it is viable because it has no zero that one three, no zero CP violation, and it is also predictive because the oscillation parameters uh, obey these two equations. And these equations map in our ignorance plane into this band indicated in green. So you can overlay this band with the generic region in color expected from generic three neutrino oscillation global fits. Okay? And you can see, for example, at one sigma in gray here, that the overlap covers a very small region of oscillation of uh, CP violation, uh, delta CP, indicating a, a good level of predictivity. Now I turn to another uh, pattern called by large leptomixing pattern. This was uh, proposed by us in Valencia 10 years ago, soon after Daya Bay. Uh, established with their first result that indeed that one three was no zero. So instead of starting from a pattern like TBM without that one three and then revamping it, what we did was different was we start with a no zero that one three right from the start and use it as a seed eh, to parameterize fermion mixing. And in fact, this is a very interesting uh, ad hoc phenomenological idea, if you want, but maybe it has some uh, theoretical significance because basically we are exploiting the observation from experiment that the smallest leptomixing angle, namely reactor, is rather close to the largest of quark mixing angle, namely Kabibo. So perhaps Kabibo, which is well measured, as you can see here, this parameter lambda works as the universal seed for the mixing of all of the fermions. Then, then it will be a task of theory to, to develop that idea. So if you do so, then things are rather nice because the mixing matrix is a power in lambda. So if you know lambda, you know them all. And indeed, this is what is shown here. You see uh, in black, the predicted solar mixing uh, angle versus the reactor mixing angle, and in blue, the predicted atmospheric mix. And if you overlay now with these colored regions arising from generic three neutrino oscillation fit, you see that the overlap nearly fixes the values of the solar and the atmospheric mixing. So this is rather aggressive uh, uh, proposal. But the idea of by large does not need to be so aggressive. In fact, here, I don't have CP violation, but I can just tell you that one has looser realizations of this idea, uh, which incorporate uh, uh, CP violation and are not so strict as the example I gave here. And to complete, I should also mention 
that there are many other leptomixing patterns eh, from other authors. For example, the trimaximal mixing patterns. Uh, and the good thing is that most of them can be probed at the next round of experiments, such as Dune. So this is very encouraging. So the advantage of the pattern is that they help you do the phenomenology. But I now turn from oscillations into a different process, namely neutrinoless double beta decay. Oscillations establish that neutrinos have mass. And the statement here is that if neutrinos are Majorana, as many of us expect, then uh, there should be a process which is neutrinoless double beta decay, which involves not only two mass parameters, like the two splittings that are well measured in oscillations, but they also involve the third mass, for example, M1. Okay. Moreover, uh, the amplitude, which I call M beta beta, for neutrinoless double beta decay, and just for short, okay, I will call neutrinoless double beta decay DBD. Okay? And DBD also involves the amplitude for DBD, M beta beta, also involves the two Majorana phases that are inaccessible to oscillation. And I should also advertise here that this uh, uh, is expressed in the symmetrical description of leptomixing that we proposed 42 years ago, and which is far, far, far better than the phase convention adopted by the PDG. The PDG basically took our parameterization and adopted a very nasty phase convention at least for neutrino less double beta decay. But of course, if you are careful, you can use it. There's no question. So my first task here is to ask from the neutrino oscillation experiments, eh, we have information on these mixing angles, on the mass splittings, eh, we don't have on M1, and we don't have on the Majorana phase. Eh? So this gives us some freedom. Is the, the question is how to parameterize the attainable values for the M beta beta amplitude, given the knowledge that we now have from oscillation. And this can be done usually in terms of M1 or M lightest neutrino mass. However, for this slide, the, my logic prefers to start from the quasi degenerate case. And to do so, I prefer to express M beta beta in a completely different way namely in terms of this degeneracy parameter eta. The parameterization is given in this recent JHEP paper. Uh, so you can parameterize M beta beta in terms of eta. So if eta is one, neutrinos are exactly degenerate. In real life, that is an ideal limit. You must depart eh, to generate solar and atmospheric oscillations. You must depart from this limit, either left to ice eh, within the blue normal ordering branch or right twice within the orange inverted order branch. Okay. You see also that for inverted ordering, there is a lower bound for the DVD amplitude. Uh, that is not the case for normal ordering. The amplitude can just vanish. That would signify a destructive interference amongst the three light neutrinos. Now, the question is, what are the restrictions we have from uh, other experiments, not from oscillations? And the first one comes from DVD searches. And the most sensitive one is Kamlan Zen. Okay? I, it rules out this brown band, which includes their latest number uh, published just this year. That is one source of information that we have on M beta beta, uh, the exclusion of this horizontal band. There is another information that we have coming from cosmology. And this was explored in this JHEP paper here in yellow. And basically, the idea is to put together the information from the CMB and baryon acoustic oscillation data. And all together, they rule out the vertical band, which, as you can see, is pretty fat. So combining with Kamlan Zen, one sees that really uh, the nearly degenerate neutrino situation is strongly disfavored by current data. 
So I moved to another possibility, namely one in which one of the three massless, one of the three light neutrinos is massless or nearly so. In this case, look what happens. Here we have two bands in blue and orange. Here I have two bands in blue and orange. But look at the blue band. It never touches zero. So there can never be a destructive interference in this case. If you have a theory which for some reason makes one of the neutrinos very light, then you must always have neutrinos with double beta decay. And the corresponding M beta beta amplitude correlates directly with the relative Majorana phase amongst the between the two light neutrinos, which is very interesting. In any case, for normal ordering, this band lies below the dashed lines that you see on the plot. And these dashed lines show the sensitivity expected in the next round of the experiment. So you see that we must unfortunately discard the normal ordering case and move up to the inverted ordering. But compared with the inverted ordering in the generic case, the band is much, much, much thinner so that it is completely covered by the expected sensitivity of the next round of experiment, especially Nexo. Even legend covers almost everything. Even the current Kamlan Zen result, which is already present, it is already the present, not the future. It, it rules out the hatched region in magenta. So if you look down at the value of the Majorana phase, it already rules out this chunk of Majorana phase, this chunk of Majorana phase, and this chunk of Majorana phase, three different pieces. I should just say, this is extremely interesting because this is for the first time in history that we're, one is starting to probe the Majorana phase. I should just warn you that the Kamlan Zen results here are used in their aggressive form concerning the nuclear matrix element assumed. So if you use a more conservative nuclear matrix element, then this hatched region gets smaller and moves up. But still, it is interesting and points to, to the future. I should also say that one massless neutrino hypothesis is not ad hoc. It are, emerges in a variety of theories of neutrino mass. So now to the three massive case. In that situation, of course, there is no guaranteed uh, lower bound if, the, if you have normal ordering. However, in theories that incorporate symmetries, flavors, family symmetries, to make sense of the oscillation results, more often than not, what you find is that there are lower bounds for M beta beta, uh, even for normal ordering. And there are many, many references. I just show one because it's very recent. You see here, for example, in the right panel, uh, the uh, region indicated by the theory, and you see the constraint given by the vertical bands, the constraint coming from cosmology. Catherine is basically irrelevant. It's very poor constraint. Now, uh, this, of course, should be very, very uh, uh, optimistic. Perhaps the discovery of DVD is just around the corner. Uh, from my point of view, however, the most uh, important thing about the DVD discovery would be its significance. Probably the discovery of DVD would be as important as the discovery of oscillation has been. And the reason is because whichever mechanism we envisage to engender DVD, not necessarily neutrino exchange, upon which I made all these estimates, whichever way you do, you always, by the black box theorem, uh, can close that non-zero amplitude and conclude that at least one uh, entry and has one neutrino uh, type is a Majorana particle. And that is, of course, uh, would be an important discovery, uh, which is completely general and uh, uh, should excite our efforts 
towards uh, more uh, sensitive DVD searches. Now I move to theory, namely to the most well-kept secret of nature, namely the origin of neutrino mass. Weinberg made a very elegant, uh, nice comment that even though the standard model lacks a neutrino mass, uh, one can produce a unique dimension five operator just by stacking two Higgs doublet with two lepton doublets. The four doublets together form a unique dimension five operator. And that operator turns into a Majorana neutrino mass down below the symmetry breaking scale. So this is an extremely profound connection. However, it is very far from the theory of neutrino mass. To go any further, one needs uh, to provide a UV completion. And from my point of view, the seesaw provides perhaps one of the most interesting ones because it opens the possibility of dynamically explaining the small neutrino mass as a consequence of minimizing a generalized Higgs potential, having not only the VEV V2 of the Higgs doublet, but also additional VEVs associated to triplet and singlet Higgs bosons present in the most general CISO. So this would be a very a, a, a elegant a explanation of why neutrinos are small. On the other hand, this kind of dynamics, CISO dynamics, opens, uh, may hold the key to the understanding of the stability of the electric vacuum. Hmm? The stability which is not at all guaranteed within just the standard model. So if you are in, in within a CISO picture, then you can generate small neutrino masses either through the type one exchange of right-handed neutrinos or the type two exchange of heavy triplet scalar boson. And the anecdote here is that in our original CISO papers, 1980 and 82, we were so excited about the triplet CISO, it was our baby, that we called it type one. But there is a good reason for that. Simply, that is the simplest CISO period. It is a fact today. But besides this nomenclature business, there was a, a deep difference between our CISO, the cyan one, and the yellow one. And that comes because the yellow CISO use left-right symmetry. So the number of right-handed neutrino must match the number of left-handed neutrino by gauge symmetry. Whereas the standard model CISO is the most general. You can have any number of singlets uh, whatsoever. In fact, I remember in our old paper, we call this CISO N for the number of doublet neutrinos and M for the number of singlet neutrinos. At that time, we did not know either of these. Today, we know we have three families because of the lab results. So we know the number of doublet neutrinos, but we still don't know the number of singlets. And so that we can still envisage the missing partner CISO schemes uh, having less singlet than doublet neutrinos. For example, 3,2 is in fact the minimal viable type one CISO. And the 3,1 is not fully viable by itself because there is a projectivity of this matrix that implies that there are no masses for the solar neutrino states, but you can lift that degeneracy in a calculable manner eh, by reconciling the seesaw paradigm with the Scotto paradigm within this 3-1 picture and obtain a complete theory of neutrino oscillation in which you also explain why the solar and atmospheric oscillation lengths are so disparate. The disparity between them is nothing but a loop factor in this kind of theory, which has been called Scotto seesaw. And there have already been several papers by different groups. So uh, conversely, one can go to a situation where you have more singlet than doublet neutrinos. A very simple case is when you add two singlets sequentially to each family of doublet neutrinos. So in the symmetry limit, these uh, two component neutrinos, they pair off to make Dirac's 
So you have three Dirac neutrinos added sequentially and nothing else. It's just the standard model structure in every respect. However, uh, neutrinos are still massless as in the standard model because that's protected by lepton number. However, you can have neutrino mixing. You can have charged lepton flavor violation and you can have leptonic CP violation. And this, so this kind of template uh, limit is a very interesting one conceptually because it elucidates the role of symmetries in the weak interaction. In particular, the role of total lepton number versus the role of individual lepton flavors. Practically speaking, it is also relevant because uh, generating the neutrino mass in such a fashion with a very small seed for lepton number violation implies that the mediator, the neutrino mass mediator, as you can see here, can be light, can be accessible uh, to colliders. Uh, they will form a quasi Dirac neutrinos, and uh, you break the lepton number a little bit, so the Dirac becomes quasi Dirac. And so you have large rates for mu to e gamma, for example, you can get enormous rates for mu to e gamma because it is not constrained by the smallness of the neutrinos. So this kind of scenario is an alternative to the high scale CISO. It is called low scale CISO. And it is as natural as the high scale CISO is. The naturalness here is simply toft naturalness. The symmetry of your theory, uh, if it increases, you are allowed to take some parameters, small or zero. And that is the explanation of the small neutrino mass. Uh, in fact, the symmetry protection of this scheme can be a double one. If one arranges for this red blob to result from a calculable radiative correction, for example, associated to some sort of hidden dark matter sector. And this is the idea behind uh, the recently proposed dark inverse CISO uh, model, uh, which is very simple idea. You have a dark matter acting as a seed for neutrino mass generation that proceeds a la CISO uh, using the uh, inverse CISO as the uh, as the underlying theory. I should say there is another low scale CISO, which is also very interesting. For example, recently in connection with the W mass anomaly, which is the linear CISO mechanism, but I will not mention that right now. Instead, I will just convince you that indeed uh, this construction provides uh, a decent theory of dark matter, of WIMP dark matter, and here it is. I plot here the relic dark matter density versus the dark matter mass. And for the case where dark matter is a scalar boson, singlet scalar boson, and you see for different benchmark choices indicated in this color that they intersect the band that comes from the Planck determination at various values of the dark matter mass, uh, very reasonable. Uh, for weak interaction theory, uh, WIMP dark matter. WIMP dark matter, remember that has nothing to do with SUSY whatsoever. WIMP dark matter here is just the mediator of the seed of neutrino mass generation. And here you see the prospect for detecting this dark matter by nuclear recoil. Uh, this is the WIMP nuclear cross section versus the dark matter mass. Uh, the expectation for the benchmarks is given in color, and the constraint from Zinner Manton is indicated in black. And recently, there have been uh, uh, stronger constraints from Panda X and, 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 and Lux uh, Zeppelin. Now, as I said, this is not only a theory of dark matter, it's also a theory of neutrino mass. And you can see here the expectation for mu to gamma C. In this example here, I find 10 to the minus 15. But this is just a benchmark. This is just an example. In fact, the mu to e gamma branching can far exceed the value shown on this plot. So one can have dark matter that can be probed in other ways. Another one is collider experiments. You can try uh, to have this uh, mediator, neutrino mass mediator, accessible to LHC or perhaps the future FCC. And so it can be studied. And this has been done, in fact, by many, many groups. I will not go in that direction, 
Instead, I will do something different, namely, try to convince you of the simplicity of our seesaw alternative, which instead of type one, we studied both, but uh, the one which was uh, really original was type two, and here it is. This is the simplest seesaw that we can possibly have, because the physics uh, giving the neutrino properties and explaining neutrino oscillations can be directly proved at, uh, for example, mu to gamma or charged lepton flavor violation searches, and also charged lepton flavor violation searches, guess where? At collider energies, at the LHC or the ILC or the SEPs or the FCC, all of these may actually provide the discovery site of the phenomenon of charged lepton flavor violation well before experiments like the MEG experiment or mu to e conversion experiment have a chance to see. And I will show here some example, which will also illustrate the potential of this simple theory to probe the oscillation parameters. So let me show here, the, for the case of E plus E minus, at three TV, the cross section for a four muon signal in Fentovarn, how it depends on the value of the lightest neutrino mass. Because this goes through the mediator of neutrino mass generation, namely this doubly charged Higgs boson. So the oscillation parameters have a direct impact upon the uh, collider expectation for the four mu one cross section. So you can see here the bounds on M lightest. You have the Catherine bound by a tritium beta decay search. You get the CMB bound from Planck, and then you have the baryon acoustic oscillation. And you can see that the value of the cross section really correlates non trivially with the value of M lightest. And moreover, you can also see that the value of the cross section distinguishes in a rather important way normal neutrino mass ordering from inverse neutrino mass ordering. So you are probing neutrino oscillations, which is a completely different type of physics, by measuring the cross section for a four muon signal at three TeV center of mass energy. So this is extremely interesting and shows the power of the simplicity of the type two CISO. Going further, one can also have four lepton final states in which the final leptons do not necessarily have the same flavor. One of them could be an electron. So this violates lepton flavor at high energies, as I mentioned to you before. So instead of plotting it versus the M light test, I plot it versus the branching ratio for mu to gamma, which is the most interesting parameter. And the vertical band is the current bound ruled out by the MEG experiment. And all the region to the left of that is completely unexplored. And you can see that within this unexplored region, yeah, the three mu on electron cross section can be about a tenth or a few hundredth of a fentobar, which is not a ridiculous cross section. And again, uh, with a big difference between the expectation for normal and inverted mass ordering. The details of this uh, study uh, are presented in these two papers, uh, so I will not uh, go into details. The main bottom line here is that high energy colliders may provide the discovery site for lepton flavor violation. So much for my run as he saw. Now I change the, the picture to Dirac's picture because you can also see so a la Dirac. This is type one Dirac see so and type two Dirac see so induced by dimension five or six operator. Now we have many more operators. They have been fully classified and also many UV completion have been provided. And the idea is always the same. You need symmetry protection for the small neutrino mass eh? and for the directness of the neutrino. And I show here the prediction of one of these models. Eh? You have here 
the, the symmetry uh, doing this job in this model is Petit Quint symmetry. So the neutrino mass is inversely proportional. It's a Dirac mass inversely proportional to the Petit Quint scale. And in the numerator, you have the scale of some extended electric gauge group. Instead of SU2 true left, you have SU3 left. So it implies to have a dynamical suppression of the neutrino mass that there must be physics associated with extension of the electric group below the Petit Quint scale. So now I turn to the flavor problem. This is probably the deepest problem in particle physics. And here, the standard model really offers no clue as to what is the solution eh, for the number of flavors and the structure and the underlying structure eh, of flavor. So uh, one should appreciate the legacy of the oscillation experiments because they have not only established that leptons mix, eh, but they have also demonstrated that they do so rather differently from the way quarks do in the CKM model. You see, we have large lepton mixing, both for the atmospheric and the solar. And in the case of, the, of quarks, all mixings are small. Uh, so why is that so? We don't know. This is just one side of the flavor problem, coin. The other side is who can explain the, the, the quark and lepton mass hierarchies? Why the muon is 200 times heavier than the electron? Nobody has any idea. Why the top quark is so much heavier than all the other fermions? Again, uh, nobody has a clue. However, I should say here that in the process of trying to make sense of the structure of lepton mixing determined by the oscillation experiment, we have come about a whole bunch of different theories all of which converge into the same quark lepton mass relation, which I call golden mass relation. It relates quarks with leptons, eh? but there is no guts, no nothing. This is just flavored standard model physics. So this relation is extremely interesting, first theoretically, and second eh, phenomenologically, because it works rather well. So much so that we can uh, probably conjecture that it forms the part of the ultimate theory of flavor. However, we don't know what is this ultimate theory of flavor. And the problem is so severe that perhaps one should be open-minded as to whether we accept a radical departure from the four-dimensional gauge theoretic framework that we are used uh, within the standard model. So let me imagine that there are extra dimensions, extra space-time dimension. For example, there is a fifth curl dimension, warped dimension. And this kind of scenario, uh, in addition to being able to explain the mixing angle due to the imposition of family symmetry, this we have demonstrated ourselves, within two examples, eh? uh, they also open the possibility, and this has been proposed by Randall Sundru and Darkani Hamed, eh? they eh, open the possibility that the mass hierarchies are just a problem in mathematics. They just follow from geometry. We have uh, demonstrated explicitly uh, as a fit, uh, not computing the, the masses, but concerning the mixing, we have demonstrated that the imposition of a non-abelian family symmetry is consistent with Einstein's equations in the fifth current dimension. And uh, it provides very, very good predictions. In this case, this is the so-called trimaximal pattern, neutrino mixing pattern that I promised before. In fact, there are two such patterns. This is the one called TM1, and which had been proposed way before on phenomenological grounds because of, its in, because of, of its interest. And here it falls naturally from this word flavor dynamics construction. And the predictions we find from that are shown here. You see up here, the ignorance plane again, delta CP versus uh, atmospheric. You have a very tight correlation. 
and very, very, very uh, uh, strong predictions for neutrino-less development of decay, whose discovery should be just around the corner. In fact, it should be around the corner if the ordering is uh, inverted. It should, it should be detected at legend. And if not, if it is normal, it should be detected at Nexo. These are experiments that are already planned. I should also say that uh, neutrinos here are Majorana. There is a variant where neutrinos are Dirac. And this also is an interesting theory for fermion mixing. Also makes very interesting prediction for neutrino oscillations. And uh, uh, the prediction here is the mixing pattern is TM2. In fact, this is a, a, an analytical prediction. Very, very simple. I should also say that these theories, both of them, allow a successful global fit of all the flavor of zeros. No predictivity in the quark sector, but a consistent fit. Now I move to, in the, along the same line, to the case with one more extra dimension. Uh, you can imagine a six dimensional orbifold compactified on a torus. The novelty that happens here is string people know these things, but they don't do phenomenology. The nice thing here is that we combine the, 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 the abstract mathematics with the predictivity. So the first thing is we identify the origin of the four dimensional family symmetry as arising from the extra dimensional isometries of the six dimensional space. So you cannot impose any family symmetry in four dimension. In fact, there is only one consistent four dimensional family symmetry. And this symmetry is a four, the symmetry of the tetrahedron. And this symmetry implies our beautiful quark lepton mass relation. And now I lay it out explicitly here for you, make it quantitative, eh, given that we know very well the lepton masses and the big quark mass, we can turn this prediction into a prediction in the plane of down and strange quark masses. We, you can also uh, use uh, this theory to make predictions for neutrino oscillations. You have normal ordered neutrino spectrum and with this very tightly prediction, predicted uh, CP phase, leptonic CP phase versus the atmospheric mixing. Again, this is the so-called ignorance plane. In, Finally, you can have a prediction for M beta beta, the amplitude for neutrino is double beta decay. Uh, you can see here the best, the best fit point theoretically is already ruled out by the present Kamlan Zen data, showing that you can really probe this theory. Eh? But still, you can have solutions that go inside this funnel all the way through to much larger masses and much smaller. Uh, undetectably small values of M beta beta. So I conclude uh, 10 years, well, this year, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Higgs boson. Many people thought that this is the end of particle physics, but never mind, neutrinos came to the rescue and the discovery of neutrino oscillation and the corresponding Nobel Prize in 2015 implied that this is not true we must provide a neutrino completion of the standard model, and nobody knows which is the neutrino completion. This is completely open up in the air, and whichever way you go, uh, my bottom line for this talk was that uh, these neutrino completion are bound to shed light on other drawbacks of the standard model, such as the dark matter problem, the flavor problem, and many others uh, listed here, which I may have touched a little bit uh, during the talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. So thank you very much, Jose. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great. Okay. So then, questions, please. Any questions? I do have a question. Please. Um, Jose, thank you for this uh, inspiring talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I have two questions. One is that I did not 
quite understood why you say that you type to see so it's you are Francisca. Right? You are Francisca. No, my name is Giovanna Gotin. Nice to meet you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know, I know you, of course. No, mm -hmm. it is the simplest for the simple reason that is the only seesaw with just one Yukawa coupling matrix. The type one has at least the Dirac coupling matrix and the Majorana coupling matrix, and really the complete seesaw has also the triplet contained in it. So you have three independent coupling matrices. If you have okay. a pure type one, you have just one matrix to describe it all. So it's also easier in the sense that it's easier to rule out. Of course, of course. Okay. And the other question that I had uh, is uh, when you presented these plots uh, for the light neutrino mass, I think it was uh, slide 11. Uh, uh, let, me see. let me see, can I share again? The PDF, which is better for this. Are you, you seeing can. my PDF? I'm not. You should share again. Sorry. I have to share again. But yes. that means that I probably need to stop sharing, right? I OK, but maybe I can ask you, may, maybe just qualitatively. So no, no, what... let me do it. Let me do it. This, okay. is, a good, this is a good question. Uh, OK. Do you see my PDF? Wait, yes. I need to. Okay, ah, okay. So this is what I was interested in. So, so how small can the web of the triplet be uh, in concordance to to mm -hmm. to neutrino data? Can it be as small as ten to the minus ten GV, for example? Look, look. There is one parameter. Uh, there are two parameters that come in: the web and the Yukawa. Mm -hmm. So. Correct. So uh, you can imagine, no, even in the Higgs sector, there is a trilinear coupling of two Higgs doublets with the Higgs triplet in the Higgs sector. How much is the value of the mass parameter associated with that? We don't know. So that's completely free. If we go, if we take it to zero, neutrinos become massless and we have the Toft protection of the neutrino mass again. So this allows, me to liberate uh, the Yukawas to be as large, much larger than I might otherwise expect from the point of view of neutrino mass. In other words, in contrast with type 1 CISO, where either you have a super large scale in your denominator with normal size Yukawas, or if you want to have the heavy neutrino in the TV range, you need to put the tiny Yukawas. Here, this is not the case because you can blame the smallness of neutrino mass to the tough naturalness par parameter, which is something else completely hidden from the phenomenology. Yeah, maybe I ask, uh, uh, use Thank this you. opportunity to ask, yeah, uh, to continue this, uh, this question. But uh, look, uh, in uh, tough uh, protection, uh, uh, you mean protection of uh, this trilinear mu parameter and what for is example, the symmetry? For example, it's yeah, like... But what, yeah, it should be probably a uh, lepton number, right? Symmetry. Yes, yes, yes. It is lepton number. However, I should say you, Sergei, that this is an effective description. Hmm? I can yeah. make the whole thing dynamical and I can make a Higgs boson. Instead of the cubic, I can have a quartic with an extra singlet and I can dial its value by minimizing the Higgs potential. So in that case, I have a dimensionless uh, parameter. And ah, I instead of mu. Ah, OK, yes. instead of mu. It's much ah, more yeah. natural than we might. Oh, sure, yes, yes, yeah, no, no. OK. That is the beauty of this. You saw that you can yes, give yes, a dynamical yes. understanding yeah. to the small neutrino mass and to the electric vacuum stability, everything. But uh, in, in this case, uh, this uh, quartic coupling would be uh, Technically natural, small, small, yeah, because yeah. it is just algorithmically divergent. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, I, it may deserve further uh, work along this direction from the more formal uh, point of view. Yeah, okay, thank you. More questions? Sí, hola, hola, Jose. <coughs> hola, tengo ¿Quién eres? Una... Yo no veo la persona que me llama. Okay, I Iván Schmidt. <laughs> oh! <laughs> hola. Eh, mucho gusto en reverte. Ya. Yeah. <laughs> reverte otra vez. Ya. Yeah. Uh, can you can you give a sort of a general 
idea why you, you get these relations in, in, in the case of uh, extra dimensions? The world? And how do they work? I mean, because there was- uh, Symmetry, symmetry. They, uh, let me see, there are two aspects. Here I yeah. show them here. The mass hierarchies. Here we have not contributed anything, okay? Mm -hmm. Here, there is only a, let's say, a wishful thinking expectation that mass hierarchies, including the electroweak hierarchy, as proposed by Lisa Randa, eh, may result from this uh, fifth dimensional and, and the, the warp factor, okay? Eh, so all the hierarchies of the fermions may also be of a similar type. And this has been actually discussed but they did not construct any realistic model. This is just a wishful thinking mm -hmm. at this level. What we did was to show that the mixing angles can be predicted and very neatly in this analytical form that corresponds to the TM1 pattern. And that follows from the imposition of the T prime family symmetry on the five dimensional uh, worked uh, space. And uh, yeah. it, the symmetry we put by hand, but the prime is a nice symmetry. It is the double cover of the A4 group. It is a brother of A4. It is a small symmetry. And uh, uh, we uh, determined, by the way, with our, uh, this paper was in collaboration with, uh, the, our first paper was in the collaboration with our Mexican friend and here with our Chinese friends. Uh, the uh, Einstein equation must be demonstrated that they work in the in the extra dimension, okay. in the fifth dimension. But this works. So yeah, the yeah. thing is, first it works, and second it is predictive. And the predictivity here is rather neat because it's an analytical one. Uh, the other model, this is the one with the Mexican people, uh, again again with our Chinese friends. Uh, this is also in J. Okay, I don't remember what is the, the first in PRD. The the first is in J. Hep, the second is in PRD. So there, the difference is that we predict TM2, which is a completely different correlation, but very similar, also analytical. And in that case, neutrino is a direct particle. So the predictions go more for neutrino oscillations because you have no double bet. And we perform as a fit. We showed that all the flavor fit parameters from the PDG, they are well described in this model, including those of the uh, quark set. And likewise, also for the orbifold, we did again mm -hmm. show that they, they provide global, a good global fit of, of flavor observers. And again, I should say, these models have variants. They are not completely unique, even though the symmetry is unique, eh? a four in this case. In the first one, it is not unique. Here you, you can play with any symmetry you want in principle. Of course, you have to check consistency. But uh, in the orbifold case, you cannot play with the symmetry. And that's a nice concept that the symmetry, in some sense, I don't know the key word for that, is an emergent symmetry. And the, the, you can only impose A4. Yeah. And A4 has its predictions, which in this case, the most characteristic one is the golden relation. Okay. And this A4, and this A4 symmetry is a consequence of uh, this, uh, of a geometry, right? Yes, yes. No. You see, mm -hmm. the six dimensional symmetry is very big. Yeah. There yeah. are isometries there. Some uh -huh. of those is isometries uh -huh. are, are the generators of the effective uh -huh. A force symmetry in A4 the four dimensional mm -hmm. okay. restriction. Thank you. I was wondering if the S4 symmetry can be obtained with this uh, six dimensional orbifolding or one on either on the different set that has to be included. I did not understand your question. The S4 could be the another non abelian family symmetry could be obtained. Yeah, S4 does not emerge in this model. So it will be another. Uh, it another will model. be another. But you can play with S4 in this case here. Here you can play with any symmetry you want. Mm -hmm. But you have to check that it is consistent and that the predictions are good. Many okay, thanks. Thank you. Very nice talk. More questions? Uh, I have a question. Please. Uh, please. Jose, could you please go back to uh, the slide in which you talk about neutrinized double better decay? Okay. 
uh, when one of the light neutrinos is massless. Oh, yes, yes, here. Uh, yeah, this one. So in this CP conserving scenario, uh, the inverted hierarchy is already ruled out or not? Mm. Uh, no, no. I should say, by the way, something which I did not mention. First, there have been several papers uh, studying this. This is a very generic thing. Any theory where one neutrino is massless or nearly so has this prediction. Now, okay. examples. Uh, I told the incomplete, the missing partner CISO, either 3,2 or 3,1 or Scotto CISO, they all have this relation. We have found this relation in other uh, theories as well. For example, we have a theory based on the electroweak gauge group SU3 left, which I think Antonio has also studied, uh, in which there is some coupling, you cover coupling, which is anti-symmetric. And as a consequence, once you calculate the neutrino mass, uh, because of anti-symmetry of the underlying Yukawa coupling, one neutrino is massless. Again, you have that. And these are just two examples. There are more examples. So it is interesting theoretically, and experimentally, the interest is that the blue band of normal ordering is rather thin and does not touch zero. However, it is still below detectability, so we move up. So when you move up to the inverted ordering case, the difference is that now it is much thinner. It's much more predictive because your parameters are much more fixed than in the generic theory, if you go to this case. And as a consequence, you find this magenta hatched region here, which is the region excluded by the current Kamlan Zen result. They, they released this year. However, I want to be a bit cautious. I make here to provoke your interest, but I also say that they are using aggressive nuclear matrix elements. With less aggressive matrix elements, this curve moves up a little bit, but certainly one sees that one will start covering this region. And if you go to the far future experiment like Nexo, it will be completely covered. So if nature has one of the neutrinos as nearly massless and neutrinos are Majorana, then we must detect neutrinos double beta decay. Okay, okay, I see, thank you. <clears throat> I have a question. Uh, yes, hi, Jose. This yes. Is, this is Claudio Deep. Hola, Claudio. Que tal? Uh, this is a bit uh, kind of not directly to uh, what you were presenting in detail, but uh, it reminded me of a question that I always had. Um, well, th there is no, say, reason why there should be CP violation uh, in the neutrino sector, especially in the light neutrinos, but there is no reason why not. So. Suppose that we observe a CP violation in the light neutrino sector, and suppose that the, the mass mechanism is some kind of CISO. Can this CP violation in the light sector tell us something about um, CP violation in the heavy sector? Well, uh, there are so many parameters involved in these things. That's a problem. What yeah. most people do is cheat. Most people do is cheat. You assume these are complete. Even we do that sometimes. But we, we say this is taken for illustration. Uh, right. If you are going to illustrate that something is possible, you are allowed to make, uh, how do you say, uh, approximations. But if you want to say that you are probing the CISO, then you should be more careful. There right. are just too many parameters. Mm -hmm. There are just too many parameters. Right. I know how well. they are in our old paper with Schechter. And there are 24 parameters in the type 1 CSO. Right. And it is just the 3,3. And I'm now doing 3,6, right? which is to, ha to have the stuff low scale. Eh? We are right. taking even more neutrinos, more neutrinos, more parameters, except that these uh, low scale models, they have this nearly conserve lepton number symmetry. Right. So that le leads to some simplification, but still to be totally general, you have a lot of freedom. 
Mm-hmm. So to, to make deep statements about CISO from the Roberta, I find it difficult. However, uh, you may have many, many scenarios which may lead to interesting uh, possibilities for the Roberta. And in so doing, you are allowed to make as many simplifying assumptions as you, as you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we played also, I mean, in fact, uh, we, we yeah. I think we are pioneers in the idea that you can detect the mediator of neutrino mass generation. Eh? I think in 1990, 91, we wrote a paper uh, in which the, from the Z0 decay, you would produce, because of the structure of, of the couplings that we characterize in our old paper, eh, you don't predict you don't couple the Z to two heavy leptons because they are not sequential. You couple to one heavy lepton and one light neutron. So did, it will lead to monojets. And we did uh, a study that we published with Michael Dietmar, an experimental physicist. He is in, uh, in Switzerland. In, uh, and uh, he was at that time in, uh, I don't know, uh, L3 collaboration. Anyways. Uh, after that, this analysis has been done in LHC, for example. It has been performed also in many, many different uh, places. Even by us, as theorists, we did some kind of approximate simulation uh, f- with Frank Depish in a model having an extra Z prime. Uh, but in that case, we, produ- we produced a heavy neutron in pairs. That's mm-hmm. the standard case. Uh, by the gauge coupling. So we have some suppression of the Z prime mass, but still we have pair production. In the old, really within the standard model, you have single production and single production is uh, quite small. Uh, Of course, you must go to low scale CISO. And nobody does this really seriously because to go to low scale CISO, you should take into account the structural properties of low scale CISO and nobody does. People do some sort of analogies. Probably they are okay for many purposes, but perhaps not for all. Uh, And again, uh, the mediator uh, can be uh, probed uh, by producing the heavy neutrino and looking for the gain. Let me, I am tempted to show you this example. This is another example of the same type, probing neutrino properties at colliders. We had a whole series uh, of papers along these lines with many collaborators, Martin Hishog. This is from this paper 10 years ago. So you produce neutralinos, the LSP from SUSY. But we have a SUSY model for neutrino mass. So SUSY is the origin of the neutrino mass. And what happens then? The mediator of neutrino mass generation is the neutralino. So you produce your neutralino. And the first thing you have is this displaced vertex. The neutralino leaves a lot before dying. Right. You can also, of course, the same thing you do with CISO. It's exactly the same idea. But something more interesting here, the fact that the uh, atmospheric mixing is nearly maximum, is close to 45 degrees, means that the signal of neutralino of Z0 decay to, to mu and tau is 50-50. It scales, you see, the branching ratio for neutralino going to W plus mu divided by neutralino uh, uh, decaying to W plus tau. Means that the neutralino decays to muons and taus 50-50. They are equal because the atmospheric mixing at low energies is what it is, near nearly maximum. So you can deconstruct the neutrino properties from collider experiments. It is difficult to do this in the CISO, really difficult, because you have many matrices. You have the Dirac matrix, you have the Majorana matrix, you have another Majorana matrix. In SUSY, it is a bit easier but still, I think this is as far as we can go. We did not plot solar because solar, it is definitely not easy. Yeah. However, if you go to the triplet CISO I mentioned before, 
that is really cute. You see here, it's just one new cover coupling, describing it all. The physics of oscillation, the physics uh, of the collider E plus E minus to four lepton signal or, or proton proton, anything you want. So you, you have a window of opportunity to probe lepton flavor violation at high energies. And that in fact can be the discovery site. You may find that well before you find mu to yama. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose. So then let us thank uh, Jose again and <laughs> hope to see you soon here. And I hope Chile. to see all of you yeah, next January. Yeah, yeah, the next January. Yeah, so then. Goodbye. Yeah. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. Bye bye. 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 bye.